you unto you quickly and fight against them which the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. Uh, Father, once again, we uh, like to say, Father, we love you uh, for first, uh, Lord, dying for us, first loving us, and uh, sending your Son the very best in all of heaven to redeem such as us, Lord, uh, truly. We'll say all our lives we're unworthy of it, uh, Lord, but we love you for it and we appreciate it. And God, we appreciate your book. And uh, Lord, as things change all around us, uh, Lord, and as uh, things uh, become worse and worse as predicted in the word of God, you still give us hope and comfort and strength. You still give us a purpose. Uh, Lord, you still give us a reason to rise every day. And so, yes. Father, we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for the future. Lord Jesus, it'd be all right if uh, you came tonight. It'd be okay, uh, God, to uh, close it all out. But if not, God, help us stand firm on the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a seat. Very good. All right. So God's made some promises to us here. And uh, I look at a lot of these promises like we deal with our kids, you know. I like to tell my kids, if you do good things, you'll get good things. But if you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. I've always told them, good boys get things, bad boys don't. Amen? Good girls get things, bad girls don't. Amen? Because that's a part of, the, uh, the, of living, man. And I see the Lord here trying to encourage his people to do right, and you'll get rewarded for it. And there's some extra blessings that you'll get if you'll do right and do good, but if you don't do so well, then you'll not get the blessing. I hate to say it, but on God's team, everybody doesn't get a trophy just because they're on his team. <laughs> Only those people who excel in his work and in obedience to him, they win the trophies. And so, when we get down here, you know, and you don't like to be negative all the time, just negative, 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 amen. You got to offer the kid something positive every now and then to help them be balanced, amen. And so, um, I see the Lord doing that here as he addresses this angel of the church in Pergamos. Right, these things saith he which hath a sharp sword and two edges. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. First he commends them. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. There are some mean places in this world where the devil seems to be in 100% total control. And of course, if you're on the Lord's side, you can be sure that uh, you're in the minority. But, as Noah proved, one man and God make a majority many a day, amen? Right, amen. Overnight, Noah went from being in the minority to being in the majority. Because God was on his side, amen, and he was on God's side. So it pays to serve the Lord. But then he had a complaint, didn't he? The false doctrine and worldliness. The church had not been practicing 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 and kicking people out of the church that didn't believe right and wasn't doing right. And what they weren't doing right is, again, they held to that doctrine of Balaam, the idea that you can make money in the ministry and sell out God's people, God's church, for money. So that when we went through the scriptures last week, we showed you how you even the, Balaam met his end with Balak and Balak's buddies. Because when the children of Israel were allowed later to kill them, where was Balaam? He was right there with them. 
he'd move right in with them. He kept opening his mouth and trying to curse Israel, and God made him bless Israel every time. Until finally he conspired with Balak and said, you got to realize this God is so powerful that the only way you're going to get God in any way to do anything to these, his people is you're going to have to get God so mad at them that God does it himself. And so if you can get their women to start messing with your boy, if we can get their boys to start messing with your women, your Moabitish women, then God will get so mad at them. God will kill him himself. And sure enough, that's what they did. So they had this big thing, this big push to get those uh, uh, Hebrew boys to come over here and mess with these girls and get into their practices of their religion and practice this bail pole and all this stuff so that pretty soon one thing leads to another. In fact, one of the Israelitish boys had one of them girls in his tent. And when Eliezer's son Phineas saw that, he took a javelin and followed him. And when they was in the tent on the ground, he ran them through with the javelin on the spot. And God was so happy that Phineas did that, that God said, guess what, that boy's going to heaven for sure. And God was going to keep going just till he wiped all Israel out. But when he saw Phineas was willing to step in for God, then he stopped the plague at 40,000. God only allowed 40,000 of them to be killed, and then the, the plague was stopped. Because he didn't like them practicing the tr wonderful holidays and pagan practices of the pagan people around them. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block for the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed on the idols. See, they had this hyper grace, oh, I'm saved, or you say, oh, we're all saved, we're all going to heaven. Ain't it wonderful, we're all saved. They had this hyper grace position, oh, you can go ahead and sacrifice things to idols, eat meat, sacrifice to idols. You can even go ahead and drink a little liquor. They had a cheap grace. They had a hyper grace position. You can go ahead and eat things, sacrifice, and not only that, you can go ahead and have sex, premarital sex, any kind of sex you want. You don't have to stay true to your mate. You can just ask God to forgive you and go on. To eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication. God was upset with this church because people in this church was teaching and believing this kind of crap. They were a King James, Bible-believing, street-preaching church that was headed into that worldly 501c3 mentality. And this corporatism, it's okay, it's corporatism. And we don't really have to take a stand. We don't really have to pay attention to all the verses of the Bible. It's just the principle of the Bible. Yeah. And God was against them for that. See? So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It was getting to where, well, if you go off to Bible school, now you're somebody. You got a piece of paper. You got a degree. You are somebody. But if you don't go to no Bible college nowhere, well, you ain't nobody. See? Conquer the laity. That's what Nicolaitans means, to conquer the laity. See, the clergy are above the laity. That's why you on these TV, just watch TV clowns. You know, all the, the ribboners, guy got up to big houses, big cars, you know, all them big TV evangelists and stuff, and pastors, you know, fat cat in it. And somehow they're better, they're smarter. Man, we got to read all their books. A little old lady with cancer writes a little book in church. Well, we can't read her book. She's nobody. We got to read the big pastor's yeah. book, see. Get sold by the millions, you know. Yeah, us and them, that's right. God says against that. Of course, earlier he told them that he hated that. That was about the church at Ephesus. They hated that. And he loved the church at Ephesus for hating that. 
but now this church, they've adopted it. It's a part of their Sunday school program. <laughs> See? So they're in trouble. Oh, the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. See? But that sounds like so much like the 21st century churches in America today. Because they're holding the things that God hates because, well, there's a dollar in it. That's just the way it's the established way. That's the way it's done. It's, a, it's The church has adopted these Fifth Avenue tactics. And it's a self-feeding establishment. You send your kid off to college, then they go get brainwashed there, then they come out like everybody else to be another clown that thinks that I'm above everybody else. I've got, I'm, I've got a PhD. I'm a postal digger. I've moved up in the world. My postal digger's on in the barn, amen. No, it's not. It's laying in the yard. I've been making, I've been putting uh, poles in the ground this week, amen. So what's he? What's his advice to them? There, what's his counsel? Repent, amen. See, repent's not something you did once when you got saved. I hope that you repent every week, maybe every day. <laughs> we do things screwy. We make mistakes. We have to repent quite often. Because we make wrong choices. And yet some clowns think that repentance ain't a part of salvation. Are you nuts? That's a part of our lifestyle. Amen. Repent. In Ezekiel, he said, turn, turn, oh backsliding Israel. There's a lot of turning back to the Lord, man. Repent. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So God will come and God will oppose and God will execute some judgment. Amen. Amen. And again, that fits a lot with what the Bible says there at the end of that seven-year period, buddy. When he comes back, that battle arm again, boom, what takes place back there? I mean, imagine people trying to be a soldier in that time, and here they're part of the UN uh, soldiers, and they're all assembled there at the Valley of Hinnom. And the blood's beginning to flow to the horse's bridle. Oops, uh, are you on the wrong side? When they start turning their guns toward Jesus, he comes riding out of the sky on them white horses, and I'm coming right behind him? Right. Amen. Amen. Boy, they're going to be in a problem then, buddy, because he's going to fight against them. Right. And read Joel, too. Read about that over there. And Nahum. Read about that. It's so, so interesting about that fighting that goes on and how, man, they're going to try to kill some of us. They're going to hit, take their sword and try to hit us, and then it's just going to bounce right off. We'll chase them, buddy. They'll be running up them little creeks and valleys and running into them hills, running into them canyons, trying to get away. They won't get away from us. We're going to be invincible. We're going to come back with the Lord as an army that's invincible. And then we see the last point is the promise to the overcomers. It's funny how in every one of these church situations, all seven of them, again, he's, he puts a lot of emphasis on this overcoming something. So obviously it must be some terrible tribulation that they got to keep overcoming. There's a promise to the overcomer. Him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And so notice what a positive thing. He always has to make it something real positive, and yet it's something quite mysterious. We don't know what Dad's got in mind, but um, we know it's going to be good. Because <laughs> Dad's been around longer than we are. We have been, and he knows a lot more than we do. And so he can surprise us with a lot of cool things and neat things. Okay, well, look what he's promises. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Now, that's interesting, because the Bible speaks of this thing. The children of Israel left Egypt, came into that wilderness, and they complained to Moses. They said, Moses, man, we need something to eat. So God answered their prayers, and in the morning they found manna. There was some kind of little tiny white something. As the dew evaporated off the grass, it left a little white something. And when they went and got a hold of this white something, uh, and they tasted it, it had like a coriander seed taste with some honey in it. And... Uh, and they didn't know what it was, so they called it manna, because the word manna in Hebrew means, what is it? Have you, have you got some of that, what is it? And so so they, they could use this to, to eat, see? So they had 
they had manna pancakes and they had banana bread and, and they just had all kinds of cool stuff and it was all made out of manna. Well, after a while they got tired of manna and then they started whining and complaining. You keep giving us manna, but we need some meat, man. We want to eat some meat here now. We ain't all vegetarians out here, Moses. And so then God sent them some quail and they still complain. Amen. So it's amazing how the church in wilderness matches a lot of the New Testament churches. And it, we sometimes just get to whining and complaining and take a lot that God's doing for us for granted. Amen? Yeah. So we can read about this. Let's go to Exodus 16. And it's so neat. Because, again, did, like I've tried to teach you, and you know we teach here, many of the Bible's stories and even the, the uh, facts of Scripture are double prophecies. It didn't just once upon a time happen true that God sent some manna out in the woods so the Jews could stay alive during the wanderness, uh, the, 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 the wilderness wanderings over there for 40 years. God's going to do it again. God's going to do it again. I mean, there's a tribulation time coming. It's going to be so tough, especially on Jews, that they're going to have to head back for those same wilderness areas and same hills and hide in. And God is going to feed them there with manna, just like he did when Moses was here. Yeah. And uh, you can read about it here. Look at uh, Exodus 16, 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. <laughs> See? Verse 14, when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in your in his tents. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So they were able to go out and pick up this little white thing off the ground and collect it. And everybody got what would be equivalent to 2.2 liters or two quarts. And then they could eat that. Amen? Amen. And then God even made special provisions. said, now if you try to lay it up for the next day, oh no, it'll stink, it'll turn to worms, it'll rot on you. And so some of them tried it, you know. Then sure enough, God was right. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, then God made an exception. He says, now well, guess what? Tomorrow is going to be the Sabbath. So make sure you bake a little extra because I'm going to make sure you get a little extra and I'll allow you to have a little extra. And sure enough, like verse 23 says, God did it and, and, it, and it would last. So see, it's all in God's hands. God made it all. God can do it all. And uh, let's go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 8. I mentioned Deuteronomy 8 this morning. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we'll see here. Um, verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, for he, that he might make thee know what man doth not live, that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Amen. See? Amen. God's got a right to put us to the test. Amen. Look at verse 16. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good. Notice, at thy latter end. What? At thy latter end. See, God is going to feed the Jews in the future. In the end times. When this man of sin is chasing them down and cutting their heads off, for not taking the name, number, and mark, he's going to hate them because they're going to be preaching the gospel. And he's going to take care of them. He's going to feed them. Look at Deuteronomy 13.3. Deuteronomy 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Amen. you got to love the Lord, and he has to be your only love. Amen. Now let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Look at verse 25. Man did eat angels' food. See, look, let's back it up a little bit. Uh, verse, verse 23, Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Now, he's not saying... When you, if you go to lunch today and eat angel's food cake, no, 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 he's not talking about that. But like it's kind of white like that, that's why they call that angel's food cake. It reminds you of manna. And the Bible says that that manna was angel's food. That's how the Jews understood and thought that. They said, wow, this cool God is feeding us, and he's giving us angel food. Amen. Angel food cake. <laughs> Amen. Let's look at Lamentations. Jeremiah Lamentations, the great prophet Jeremiah. Notice what he says here in Lamentations 5 and verse 9. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. See, as sure as they went out and gathered that bread with the peril of their lives, I mean, maybe a lion would jump up and get them. Maybe some wild beast would attack them. Maybe a scorpion would sting them. If they took their lives in their hands out there in that wilderness. You've got to remember, these people mostly were city slickers. They were used to just being servants in the, in the city of Egypt. For, for hundreds of years. And so when God called them out in the wilderness, this was the, they weren't used to survival training like this. Right, right. <laughs> That's why God had to tell the women, now look, ladies, if you're on your period, you stay indoors because, man, them animals, wild animals, man, they can smell blood. And, man, you're putting your life in your hands. You step outside in the wilderness. Because they were city slickers. They didn't have a clue what they was doing. He even had to tell them, now, when you go out take a dump, take a shovel. <laughs> you think they'd know better. But anybody who's been through modern Europe knows that, man, stupid Europe, even to this day, many of those towns and cities. I've even been in Mexico where, guess what? Everybody urinate, urinates and defecates in the sewer on the street. And it runs down the middle of the road, literally, with the flies and all the mess. And the kids get out there and play, you know, get your bulldozer going and little trucks. And so, I mean, it's, it, it, and they get sick. You wonder why, and they die. You wonder why. Because people don't understand the laws of sanitation. So in the, risking their lives in the wilderness, God fed them, and they'd pick up the food right off the ground. And God's going to do it again. Amen. Now look at Micah. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Micah, chapter 7. The last chapter. And let's look at verse 14. Micah 7.14, Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thy heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood. The Bible teaches if you want to survive, head for the hills. Yes. Which dwell, dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. See? See? The prayer of Micah the prophet was that Israel would once again be able to go out in the wilderness and God would feed them there with manna. The promise that God would feed his people has double prophecies. Verse 15, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. God is going to do it again. 
It's not a big deal for God. He can do it again, and He will do it. He's going to do it again. Praise the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Even the Lord Jesus spoke about, pray that your flight be not in winter. <laughs> and he said, even if you're on the roof of your house and come down, he said, don't go in the house to get anything. You just keep moving, buddy, and head straight out of that city and head for the hills. <coughs> now here in Matthew 14, 15, he said this. And when it was even, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said to them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. They say to him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. He commanded them all to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. Not only was everybody filled that was hungry so that no one was hungry anymore, but they even had enough leftovers that every one of the disciples could take a whole basket home. <laughs> for that midnight snack. Amen? And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So if you really believe the Bible, you know that it is no big thing. God can easily feed his children in the wilderness. Amen? We've got a promise we can hold to. God's people can hold to. And God's people will hold to. Revelation chapter 12. Let's look at this future event when Israel will be persecuted by the dragon and see where she hides. Let's see where Israel's going to hide. Revelation chapter 12. This is not something that happened way back in Amen. time at the beginning so that one-third of the angels once fell. No, no, let's talk about the future, boys and girls. This is the future. And he says in verse 6, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God to his throne. Verse 5 says, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed, look it, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. There it is again. See, he's going to feed those Jews in the wilderness. As in the days of old. Hallelujah. God's going to take care of them. And believe me, God's promises are true. Amen. And so, can you see why I say I think these seven churches are probably seven churches in the tribulation period? because it just matches and fits perfectly with everything it says about this tribulation period and how that not everybody will be an overcomer. Not everybody can live without taking a name, number, and mark in their right hand or forehead or even worship the image of the beast that's going to come alive again at the hands of the false prophet. Amen? So God's trying to encourage these people to love him and stay true and not be quitters. And so he says the overcomer not only will he get to be with me forever, but guess what? I'm going to give him the hidden manna. Now, don't you know Moses had a little bowl? And he had him collect some of that manna, and he put some of that manna in the bowl. And every now and then they'd go to that they go to that altar. He put that inside the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, there's Aaron's rod that budded, manna, and the Ten Commandments. Even when Moses wrote the law, all five books of the law, they had to, that was a pocket in the side, and they put that in that pocket in the side of that Ark. They even had that in there. Had a little hidden side pocket in it. And... Uh, so here the people are out gathering their manna, 
and then getting a little extra on Friday night, so that, or on Friday, so they have enough to get them through Friday and Saturday, right. for they'd have to go back after it on Sunday, right. and it would last. Amen. But all the time, God had some that never rotted, never stunk, stayed in the altar, in the Ark of the Covenant. It was the hidden manna. They they didn't get to see it. They, nobody nobody was allowed to see it. Very rarely did anybody ever lift a lid on it. It's been lifted a few times. And even my friend Ron Wyatt, when he found it over there, he did lift it and he looked and he said it wasn't in there. So somebody took it out. <laughs> you know. The Bible tells us how even the people made a big thing out of that out of that fleece that uh, Gideon used once. And they even had that and stuffed that down in there for a while. And the people got to where they was worshiping it. Man, they had to get rid of that thing, man. You, don't, you see, we don't worship things. Amen. See. But besides that, you know, besides the altar that Moses made, he was told to make everything according to the pattern of what he saw in heaven. So it really don't matter what is in the ark over here today. The question is, what's in that one up in heaven? See. Now, by every account, when you read this, what the Bible says about that manna, it tasted good. It didn't taste bad. People weren't spitting it out. But I just imagine if God's got some real special angel food cake <laughs> that he keeps up there that's eternal in the heavens in the Ark of the Covenant that he's sitting on. Amen. What if he said, I'm going to give you something special. Come over here, sweetheart. You know? You ever been to Grandma's house and she just happens to have some little candy bars or suckers or some kind of candy? And, you know, all your brothers and sisters are up at the house, but you get because Mamaw's giving you something special. Amen? And that's what the Lord's saying. Hey, man, man, if you just be an overcomer, guess what? I'll let you eat some of the hidden manna. Woo! I'll let you have some of the good stuff. Amen? And I'll give him a white stone. Now, you, you don't want a black stone. You want a white stone. Amen? Yeah. A white stone. Matthew 13, 46. Matthew 13. Here's the stories told about... We've got, we've got eight stories here about the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13, 46. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one great one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and bought it because he knew it was a good investment. He knew he didn't have way ahead, but he had to temporarily for a little while sell everything he had to get it. But it was worth the trade. See? And the Lord has promised you, unlike your friends and neighbors, it came seem to listen to the devil and give in and live in sexual sin and debauchery. If you can be an overcomer and be in obedience to the Lord and be holy for the Lord, and be a great witness for the Lord. He's going to promise you not only the hidden manna, but a white stone. Now, the Bible is not clear. The high priest, he put on a t-shirt. And in the t-shirt, there was a pocket. And over that t-shirt, he had the breastplate. And God had the people build that breastplate just right so that all 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel were on that golden breastplate. And then underneath each one of those beautiful stones were the names of the 12 tribes of Issachar. There's or, Issachar, 12 tribes of Israel. There's Issachar, there's Judah, there's Reuben. See, there's these 12 names. And 
if the king or anybody wanted to inquire of the Lord, they could come to the high priest, and as the high priest had that breastplate on, they could literally ask the Lord anything. Uh, how far is it from here to the sun? Uh, you know, when a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around, does anybody hear it? <laughs> or it doesn't make a sound or whatever. Any question they want. And God would give them the answers. Now, in that pocket, the priest had two things. One was called Urim, and the other was called Thummim. And the word Urim and Thummim simply means lights and perfections. Now, it may have been nothing more than a black stone and a white stone. And if you had a question, you could come to the priest, say, well, uh, what about this guy? Uh, has he been beating his wife, or should we let him go? <laughs> and if the priest put in his hand and pulled out the Urim, it was one way, and if he reached his hand and pulled out the Thummim, it would be the other way. And the Bible goes to great lengths to explain that, did you know even the drawing of lots, the Lord's in it? Yes. That the Lord's in the drawing of lots, and that's why even the Bible says that when they went to draw lots, well, who's qualified to take over Judas's place? Well, we've got two fellows. Well, which one? Well, we don't know. Well, let's draw lots and find out which one God's picked. And sure enough, they figured it out. They said, for sure it has to be somebody that's been with us from the beginning. Because, you know, there were always 70. Besides the 12, there were always 70 others that went out visiting Luke chapter 10 and so forth. Just like there was the 12 in Matthew chapter 10. There was also 70 others. But of all those people who followed Jesus, it had to be somebody that had been with him from the beginning. And there was two fellows that were qualified to take his place. And they figured it out by the drawing of lots. So... It could have been, been that simple. could have been that simple. But, you know, I kind of am a reader after Dr. Pete Ruckman. I love Dr. Pete. And Pete has a way of kind of making things a little more romantic and modern. And uh, he suggests, you know, that thing was gold. And did you know when they started making computers, one of the first things they said, is, wow, that gold is the best conductor for electricity. And when computers were first invented, the reason you couldn't afford a computer when they first were invented because they had a lot of gold parts in them. See, and Dr. Pete suggests, who knows, maybe in the wisdom God gave those guys to put that stuff together, maybe when they went to that priest to ask God questions, all of a sudden there was a little light that came on right over the R of Reuben. A little light came on in that big, beautiful red stone. Then all of a sudden the, the, there was a little light over here on the, at the eye, this green the green stone of Issachar over here, the eye of Issachar, all of a sudden there was a little light that came on there, R-I, and God would spell out, and it's somebody sitting there taking the code, writing it all down. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman suggests that maybe that's what it was. Because God's always super genius, you know, when he does stuff. And I, I like that. I think that's cool. Yeah, maybe that's it. Because <laughs> it means lights and perfections. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, priest is just standing there and, you know, because he puts in the urim and the thummim, now all of a sudden he asks God a question and God gives him the answer. And they're reading it like a computer screen, you know. <laughs> Brother George probably likes that. Yeah, that's true. I remember that too. That's got a contemporary romantic idea, amen. Yeah. Again, it's probably a little more reality, just a black stone and a red stone, you know, <laughs> black or white stone. But did you know we can go to Montana today, and they have a thing called a Montana agate. How many of you know what a Montana agate is? It's so beautiful. Here's this stone that's God's nature, and you can kind of tell. You hold it up to a light. Sure enough, it's translucent. It's like a piece of glass. But it's, of course, rough because it's, it's real clear. But in the center, you can tell it's got, like, got some kind of dark nucleus in it. It almost looks like a, a rock that's a frog egg or something. You know what I mean? And so... Rock hounds take these Montana agates and they slice them with a diamond dust saw. And when you actually, and there's this beautiful, clean, clear, like glass around it, and in that middle is a beautiful picture. 
it looks like a, a there's, you see mountains in the background, you see a tree, and you see a water and a reflection of the tree in the water. It's just beautiful. And yet nobody painted it in God. Amen. And the truth is, if they cut it another direction, you probably wouldn't even see a picture. But they just, by chance, look at it, and they just slice it, and wow! Look at this cool, and of course they make Texas ties out of them, you know, and, and you look at this beautiful agate, and it looks like a painting, but no, it's just something God made, and he put it in a stone. Right. And unless you cut the stone, you'd never know it was there. It's just in a rock you pick up off the ground. And it's so cool. And it makes it very valuable. The prettier the picture, the more valuable it is. Well, imagine God gives you a stone. It's a white stone. And you can open the stone up. And it has God's special love name just for you. Amen. Because, you know, we all have little names. You know, we call each other. You call your wife something. She calls you something. You know, we don't know. We're not in your house. And the truth is, we don't want to. That's right. <laughs> my grandpa had some names for my grandma. And I look back at them now, and I kind of figure out what they mean. And I think, oh, man, why did he ever call her that? And I would be embarrassed to even tell you what it was. Because right. I know now it was saying a lot more than it sounded like at the time. <laughs> and it bordered on, uh, you know, being vulgar. And... Uh, well, I wonder what the Lord would call you. Now, my dad had a favorite name he called me. And in my household, especially when I was a teenager, you knew who he was hollering at whenever he hollered, Goofy, come over here, Goofy. That was my name. My dad called me Goofy. That was his tender name for me. <laughs> because I guess I couldn't always follow orders or I didn't follow them correctly. And I hope the Lord has a, a great name for you and it's not, you know, lazy or good for nothing. or You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be embarrassing? I've often said if I ever had a CB handle again, I'd call myself good intentions, you know, break or break good intentions, you know. Because, you know, I mean well, but, I, you know, I'm able to totally screw things up like anybody else. Amen. Amen. And I hope the Lord's name for me just ain't good intentions. Amen. Right. Amen. But he'd be justified if that's what he wants to call me. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But imagine he's got such a special name for you that when you read it, you're going to know that's me. But it's a, it's a term of endearment. See, this is why they wrote that Christian song in our hymn books. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And Because one of these days, I'm going to get to find out what, he's, what my special name is. Because the Lord loves you. He knows you intimately. And he's going to have a name. And nobody else is going to even know what it is and care to know who it is. But it's the Lord's name for you because he loves you because you're an overcomer. Amen. Now, again, if you're an overcomer, that means you've got to overcome some things. You've got to put some things down. you got to deny yourself some things. You can't go along with the world. You can't go along with the devil. Tim will overcome with will I give the hit, eat of the hidden manna, and we'll give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine which no man knoweth saving, he that receiveth it. It's a precious name. It's a good name. It's a name of endearment. Let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. We know it's true. Yeah, man, maybe we're not qualified for this overcoming like these tribulation saints are. Because, boy, we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. <laughs> we got it so easy. And we are rich. <laughs> In 2013, every one of us living here in America are rich compared to these dear saints in this tribulation period. And what they're going to have to go through and what they're going to have to suffer just to hold on to being true to Jesus and being a true follower of Jesus Christ. To go up against the forces of the government and them trying to force you to take a name, number, and mark in your right hand and forehead or worship an image of a beast just because some foolish false prophet says to man Lord forgive us for being such wusses and believing Satan's lies that we won't hand out the track we won't witness we won't try to win somebody and trust you that you'll protect us so what people are going to think you're nuts or crazy well, so what somebody even files charges against you and tries to steal your stuff away from you as long as it's because the uh, 
our testimonies because the devil hates us. It's okay. The things in the next world will count much more than anything in this world. So thank you for your promises. Thank you that, Lord, you're trying your best to convince us that it'll be worth it. Stay true. Don't compromise. How we pray for everyone here, Lord, that if there's somebody here, they're really not sure they're going to heaven. We've got a lot of boys and girls that are hearing about Jesus. Some of them have been taught to love Jesus. We know they need to repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus to be saved. And as they reach that point of accountability, Lord, we pray that they'll be tender towards you. And as the law is preached, that sin will revive and they'll die so that they'll want to be saved, be raised by Jesus with that resurrection power, that salvation, and be raised from the dead. Thank you that you made it so easy and yet it's so important. May everyone here believe on Jesus as their Savior. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. What page you got, Mom? 272. I always sing the song. We invite you to step forward. And then you're coming. Say, Church, pray for me. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Amen. Thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to Thee. Out of my sickness into Thy health. Out of my want and into Thy self. Out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee out of her sorrows into thy palm, out of life's storms. And into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee out of myself to dwell. Tears above, upward for aeon wings like a dove. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of thy sheltering fold. 
ever thine face to be Jesus, I come to thee. Amen. All right, let's have Joel Sexton pray for us, and we'll be dismissed in prayer today. Yeah, it's helped us now.